Dear friends of the Bruno Kreisky Forum, a warm welcome again in this, in this house uh, uh, at the evening of our program Genial Dagegen. Uh, again, I have to say, again with our friend James Galbright. Uh, he is not the first time here, not the second time. I, I, I lost the count. I think it's the fourth or fifth time we, 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 can, uh, we, ha we can hear him today from this podium in the last 15 years or 20 years. Um, mostly from this podium. One time we did it per Zoom during the pandemics. I can remember. Uh, Jamie, wonderful that you are here again. James Galbraith, Galbraith will give a, a lecture here about inflation sanctions and industrial policy. And afterwards, we will also have the possibility for a question and answer here. We are for sure especially interested also in his thoughts about the outcome of the European elections and the economic um, problems uh, this might also cause in Europe. Uh, and uh, James Galbraith is an American economist, as you know, he is currently a professor at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs and at the Department of Government, University of Texas in Austin. He is also a senior scholar with the Levis Economic Institute of Bard College and part of the Executive Committee of the World Economics Association, created in 2011. If this is all right, I hope. James, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, and let me first of all just state my great pleasure at being back here in person. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, this is an institution which has a long tradition of friendship with my family, uh, uh, and so it's, uh, it's just a, a terrific pleasure to be, to be here. My purpose today is uh, not to speak in depth on any one topic, uh, but rather on several quite different ones. Um, recent economic policy issues and actions that, I, in my view, were representative of a common larger problem, which is uh, the loss of connection between reality uh, and what is called mainstream or conventional uh, economic thinking, informed by an academic economics uh, that uh, solidified I'd even say petrified or fossilized uh, a half century ago. My claim is that in each of the cases I want to discuss, and even where at first class there appears to be some departure uh, from the, uh, 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 an element of new initiative, that actually the grip of doctrines that were forged in long ago ideological conflicts uh, remains unbroken and produce, precludes understanding the actual situation uh, as it is, let alone framing an appropriate policy, which may not be available in any event. Uh, this problem is aggravated that, at least in the United States, the commanding heights of public discourse on economic issues continue to be dominated by economists, and I hesitate to say this, but economists of my own generation, uh, who were brought up in an age of relative certitude and complacency, and who have not felt it necessary to alter their views since they uh, acquired them in their 20s or early 30s. In this respect, this generation, my generation, is quite inferior to the earlier one, my father's and others, of neo, uh, the early generation even of the, of the neoclassical economists, uh, at least some of whom, Sir John Hicks, even Milton Friedman, Frank Hahn at Cambridge on some points, came late in life to doubt the validity uh, or the permanence of their earlier convictions. Um, so this worldview that I want to discuss actually predates the neoliberal or ne uh, worldview or the market fundamentalist worldview that came to be the dominant one in the, in the, in the 19, late 1970s and 1980s. So I really want to talk about people who were framed in the quasi-Keynesian period uh, whose, challenge, um, whose challenges were, this period's challenges were reconstruction, decolonization, economic development, and above all, 
successful competition with the Soviet Union uh, in the Cold War. Uh, they, uh, and largely in the domain of, of raising uh, living standards through the mechanism of economic growth, which was to be managed effectively by public authority, uh, but in the American case at least, left in most particulars uh, to the discretion of private capital uh, informed by the household preferences. This is the age of consumer sovereignty and the democracy of the dollar. This worldview vested public authority with responsibility to control unemployment and inflation, largely through manipulating so-called trade-off between them. Uh, and once voices, and here again I refer to my father, uh, who uh, were called for more direct public control over prices, had been marginalized and neutralized. Uh, the same worldview produced growth theory, neoclassical growth theory, explaining overall growth by its main components, capital, labor, and productivity, or technical change. And it largely saw the private or the corporate sector as, uh, the efficient, as an efficient manager of industrial processes, responsive to incentives, even presumably to those that were set out by the state. Uh, the issue was, in that case, was whether it was wise for the state to set such incentives, but not whether so much whether the market would respond if it did. So I want to take up three uh, issues which have recently illustrated how this period of thinking persists in our own time. The issues are the uh, post-pandemic uh, so-called inflationary surge of 2021, 2022, which I've referred to as the quasi-inflation of that period. Secondly, the imposition of sanctions uh, uh, intended to cripple the economy and the war effort of the Russian Federation. And thirdly, in the United States, the adoption in the Biden administration of what's come to be called industrial policy, uh, which is an apparent departure, but I would argue not a real departure uh, from the, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this um, sort of, of, of thinking. So let me take up, first of all, the inflation the so-called inflation question. Uh, it's almost 40 years since inflation disappeared in the early 1980s until its dramatic return in 2021. And during that time, the associated doctrines over control over inflation, which continued to be discussed even though there was no practical use for them, uh, underwent many minor variations. There was a the Phillips curve, the trade-off between inflation and unemployment, which initially sloped downward and then became vertical and then later on flat. There was the control of the money, of money supply, which came and went as a doctrine to replace by administered control of interest rates and forward guidance, uh, also called inflation targeting. Uh, the common denominator of these doctrines, the thing that didn't change, uh, were two things. One was the view that inflation was itself a macroeconomic phenomenon uh, driven by excess demand uh, and that it was to be managed uh, by a central bank, that the responsibility for dealing, it, dealing with it was the job in the United States of the Federal Reserve or eventually in Europe of the European Central Bank. This was a formula that was very convenient in some political respects. It placed the blame for causing inflation on spendthrift governments who supposedly were motivated by uh, to curry favor with their voters um, while delegating the cure uh, to central bankers who were vested with a unique uh, concern for higher public purpose in this matter and who wielded a tool that by coincidence dramatically alters the balance of income between those with liquid, ass, liquid wealth and those without. And this, uh, as my father liked to say, people who have money to lend tend to have more money than people who do not have money to lend. Um, and this enduring and conventional spirit, Larry Summers, the uh, first among equals in this respect, uh, complained in the early Biden months of excessive fiscal stimulus, uh, along with many others, uh, fell into line behind the so-called fight inflation program of Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve. But the price surge of 2021 was not driven by fiscal 
stimulus. It wasn't even related to fiscal stimulus. The primary force was rather the rise of oil prices. Uh, returning to previously normal levels, exacerbated by a slow growth of energy supply in the United States, which had to do with the strategy of private equity that had taken a strong position in the oil fields of Texas during the pandemic. And the result was a squeeze which raised the price, giving the, uh, a large windfall to the producers for a certain period of time. Aggravating factors included supply chain disruptions, a semiconductor shortage, uh, which affected new cars and therefore the price of used cars, and various developments in the real estate market, uh, which uh, have to do with the way in which uh, rents are imputed uh, to homeowners uh, in the accounts, and this is about 30 to 40 percent of the consumer price index in the United States, but it has nothing to do with new production of housing or anything else. Moreover, the entire spike in prices peaked in June of 2022, only three months after the Federal Reserve began to raise interest rates, and they'd only raised them by 75 basis points at that moment. So one cannot say, one cannot say on the one hand that the inflation had anything to do with fiscal stimulus, and one cannot say that its peaking and decline had anything serious to do uh, with the Federal Reserve's actions. That doesn't prevent people from saying these things, but it reflects the lack of correspondence uh, between the uh, thinking behind these matters and the reality. Was there a fiscal boost behind the demand recovery? The answer to that is no. Yes, there was a lot of cash and assistance to households in the pandemic and more at the start of the Biden administration, but American households receiving aid are not the kind you were uh, prevalent in the imagination of economists of the 1950s, or you give them money, they spend more. They operate, like households these days operate on balance sheets. And what they did was to raise their savings to about 30% of income uh, when they were getting more income than they needed, and they drew that down as their expenses uh, caught up over time. Uh, <coughs> a uh, small minority, in the upper tier who were deprived of many of the services that they normally consume shifted their expenditure into physical assets, stocks, and real estate, uh, and automobiles. And that drove up some prices, but that again was a shift, not an increase in the overall level of effective demand. Um, further and finally on this topic, and I'll move along as quickly as I can, we observe that central bank policy, which has now raised the interest rate in the United States to above 5% on the shortest term assets for over a year, has not worked, two years actually, to deflate demand, it has not caused unemployment, and has not brought inflation down by inducing slower growth or recession. On the contrary, growth has remained relatively strong, the unemployment rate remains very low. Why is this? And the answer to that is, I think, primarily because the level of public debt in the United States is a much larger share of GDP than it was 50 years ago. And the result is when you start paying interest at high levels on public debt, you're flooding the system with income. And when you pay interest to banks on their reserves, you're flooding them with income as well. So the Federal Reserve is acting in a way that economists don't recognize as a supporter, not a restraint on economic activity. Uh, and this is in addition to what have now become large fiscal deficits from other causes, notably the uh, so-called Inflation Reduction Act. But the point I make is that despite a very petrified view of how the inflation process works, fiscal policy causing it, monetary policy curing it, neither of these forces is actually corresponds to the reality of the American economy at the moment. Okay, second topic. Uh, by both official US Treasury and leading academic accounts, uh, headquartered among other places at Yale University, the goal of sanctions against Russia was to deprive the Russian government of funding uh, and to weaken the Russian economy by removing capital, labor, and innovation or entrepreneurial talent. 
the three core elements of the neoclassical production scheme. In addition, there were political elements targeting the personal assets such as real estate and yachts held by Russian oligarchs in the West, presumably to turn them against the regime. I have some difficulty fitting the first of these elements, the idea that you deprive a country of funding uh, into any coherent framework, whatever. Russia is not a company. It is not constrained to run at a profit. It is a country with a government and its own money, credit, banking systems. It does not need dollars or euros except to buy things from the US or Europe, which it mainly doesn't need to do. But even on its own terms, the funding squeeze, the idea that you're going to deprive the Russian economy of real resources, it failed. The price of Russian exports rose uh, by more than the volumes declined, so their export revenues increased. Meanwhile, imports were actually constrained, so Russian financial holdings increased substantially in the first year after the escalation in 2022. Not that it matters, because the financial assets are not being used. They're simply reserves. So that's an accounting number, not, a, not a, something that's of great economic significance. A much more spectacular failure was in the logic of material production. It is true that the Russian economy was disrupted by sanctions. Uh, both sides, by the way, agree on this. The sanctions did not fail. They were not successfully evaded. There was certainly some evasion, but both sides agree that there was a large-scale disruption across the board in practically every productive sector uh, in the Russian economy. But the question is, what happened then? And here, the neoclassical logic the one that my contemporaries were brought up with and which they applied according to their own official statements. I could give you a document uh, or a briefing uh, done by the chief economist of the Treasury Department, which is headed by a distinguished economist of my generation or a little older, Janet Yellen, uh, you know, gave to describe their thinking on this subject. This, this is the, uh, this, this logic is in rather sharp contrast to the ordinary logic of a business uh, operation. By blocking Russian resource, uh, resource exports, oil and gas, uh, minerals, sanctions lowered the cost of resources inside Russia while raising them, as I don't need to tell you, rather painfully in Europe. By forcing Western firms to abandon Russia, sanctions forced the uh, um, financial transfer of real assets uh, to Russian businesses, which had to be sold off at less than half of their appraised value. Uh, and it increased the market potential and uh, eliminated Western competition inside Russia for Russian firms, while depriving Western firms of what previously had been profitable markets in Russia. The loss of talent which was talked about at the start of the war, such as it was, maybe 100,000 or so people who left Russia, young people, uh, could hardly be critical so long as the Russian education system continued to renew the supply. And this is what education systems do. If you have young people in technical uh, uh, positions and they leave, well, they got there because they were educated in the system and then more young people will be around to, to replace them and all of that seems to be happening. In sum, the failure was not of the sanctions themselves. It was of the analytical framework presumed to apply compounded by a condescending attitude toward Russian capabilities, as, which is not a new phenomenon either. But ordinary business logic, dynamic and forward-looking, easily points to the actual result, which was and is bright profit prospects for Russian businesses operating in a newly decolonized and uh, also substantially protected economy, underpinned by effective education, abundant resources, satisfactory infrastructure. Meanwhile, the oligarchs, uh, for whom personal assets were preeminent, have largely fled the scene, uh, losing access to uh, the influence they may have formerly have had. And the policies that brought all of this about were not policies that would have been open to the Russian government on its own 
in early 2022. They wouldn't have done it. They couldn't have done it. They couldn't have done it and maintained the, the pretext of legality. So this is why I have described these policies as effectively a gift uh, to the Russian uh, Federation, to the Russian government, Russian people. So let me go to my third example, industrial policy. As initiated by the Biden administration, and this may raise some eyebrows because uh, this was a topic that was widely debated and largely uh, uh, defeated in the 1970s and 1980s. It was rejected by what were then conventional liberal or left-center democratic economists. Paul Krugman comes to mind in this respect. Charlie Schultz, more senior figure at that era also. Uh, so that its emergence today as a consensus policy seems to be quite a major shift of ground. Such anyway is the thrust of a statement that was issued in Berlin a few days ago by economists who include Danny Roderick of Harvard, Barry Eichengreen of Berkeley, pillars of the center left mainstream, oh, and was celebrated uh, as a breakthrough by the historian Adam Tooze. But the problem here is less with the ends than with the means and context. The ends or goals are to reestablish a balanced, largely self-sufficient middle-class economy with a competitive advanced industrial base. This is entirely in line what the, with what the economists of the early post-war era took for granted. They lived in a time of industrial supremacy on which they believed further government guidance uh, to industry could not improve. What has changed, obviously, is that context, thanks to deindustrialization, globalization, outsourcing the rise of China. Back in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, the government's role in supporting science and technology, nuclear power, aviation, telecommunications, space, was generally accepted, in part due to the Cold War. And the new uh, breed, uh, in this respect, is not at all new, but very much in that tradition. They have only mustered the courage to challenge the extreme market fundamentalism that became dominant in the 80s and 90s, while passing, while they were all passing, while we were all passing through early middle age. But things really have changed. The first is that some industries, semiconductors are our leading case, commercial aviation is another one, are truly global. And it is difficult to see how either supply chains or markets can be deglobalized, let alone at a sufficient scale. It's one thing to do what the US is doing, which is to subsidize the building of new, semi new factories, semiconductor plants in Arizona, for example. It's quite another to construct an, an entire supply ecology with all of the rare earths and neon gas and so forth that it requires, and to operate it at a profit when your, comp when your chief competitor is four times larger, uh, well-established, not beholden to Wall Street and its required rates of return, and provides half the market uh, for the world production of semiconductors. Uh, so that's one problem. And the other one, equally serious, maybe more serious, is that 40 years of market fundamentalism, with the deindustrialization that it has brought about, financialization, deregulation, privatization, have taken their toll. A state that could define, execute, and oversee technical tasks on the scientific and engineering frontier no longer exists in the United States. Those powers have passed notionally to the corporate sector, which has largely dissipated them or lost them overseas. What remains in, to the government is largely a check writing power, something we used very effectively in the pandemic when it was helpful. But what happens after the checks are written and after the next election is largely beyond executive supervision and control. Indeed, it is difficult for the US government to decide how to allocate the checks Congress authorizes, which is why the Department of Commerce recently delegated that task uh, 
uh, in the, under the, the so-called CHIPS Act to a committee of outsiders, of consultants drawn from Wall Street. Moreover, under a fig leaf of anti-monopoly rhetoric, the subsidies have been spread as widely as possible, especially under the infrastructure law, which necessarily guarantees that local priorities predominate, which in the infrastructure cases, roads, bridges, and so forth. They're to controlled by real estate interests and have nothing to do with competitiveness or even with industry. So I do not think that my friends who just signed this industrial policy manifesto in Berlin were properly cognizant of the intellectual uh, situation. They positioned themselves as bold representatives uh, of uh, bold repudiators of free market fundamentalism at the forefront of new thinking. But in fact, what they have done is embrace a return to some very old thinking, which was still dominant when many of them, that is say us, were in college and graduate school. In this respect, they are not unlike Larry Summers on inflation or Janet Yellen's Treasury Department on sanctions. They feel gratified in late maturity by the vindication of ideas that they held when they were very young. This is a problem. And I regret to say that the next generation to come along, which was raised under, well, I meant to mention a compatriot of many of yours under Friedrich von Hayek uh, and uh, his colleagues, also Milton Friedman, this next generation will unfortunately be worse. It will take a true upheaval to bring something better to the fore. However, uh, with the help of the economics profession, as they are, such an upheaval, upheaval is almost certainly on the way. Thank you very much. Thank you, James, about, uh, for this keynote on so many issues and topics. Uh, and I just want uh, uh, to ask some more questions about because you uh, deconstructed the ideas about uh, uh, industrial policy. I also found an, an pa a paper or an article you wrote with the uh, inspiring t uh, title, Industrial Policy is a Good Idea, but so far we don't have one. Yes. Uh, would, you say, would you say, because uh, in line with that, what you mentioned before, that industrial policy isn't uh, really possible again, given the framework of globalization, uh, that there are n n no word uh, ec ec ecology of firms around, or should, uh, or is it possible that it has to be done better? Well, industrial policy, what is conceived of as a national ec effort and enterprise, designed to uh, achieve a certain, you know, set of results in the global economy, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the global economy has changed a lot. Mm -hmm. I uh, actually did another paper a couple of years ago uh, on China and the supply chain. Uh, that was based upon a whole of government study that the U.S. Um, so uh, government released in the summer of 2021. So it was an early Biden administration. Um, and uh, various departments contributed to this, including on semiconductors and wear earths and uh, um, electric vehicles. Uh, and the conclusion from reading that was a very good study. Uh, was that you really can't do this without, you can't break these things, break up the world economy mm -hmm. as it presently exists without doing enormous amount, without suffering enormous losses. Mm -hmm. uh, this, the semi again, the semiconductor market is, the, you know, the interesting point is that they made in this study, White House study, mm -hmm. is that half the market is in China. Mm -hmm. So what if, you know, so we, we start producing semiconductors, uh, let's suppose against all probability that in Arizona you can produce them like they produce them in Taiwan. I don't think that's the case. In fact, I'm confident it's not the case. Uh, where are you going to sell them? Exactly how is this going to work? Who's going to buy all the semi? If you're producing semiconductors at the global scale, where's your market? Taiwan's not going away. China's not going away. Are, we going to, are the Chinese going to buy expensive semiconductors from us when they can get cheap ones from Taiwan? 
I don't think this has been thought through. I think what is actually happening is a desire to produce a certain number of semiconductors that can be sold to the Defense Department. Is that an industrial policy as such for the larger benefit of the economy? No, it's a, it's a protection for a military sector, which certainly has some use, use for semiconductors, uh, but which has its own problems of industrial quality, as you perhaps have noticed. I mean, let's not get into the, to the military situation in, on, the, on the front lines in Ukraine, but it, does not, it is not an encouraging, uh, let's say, uh, advertisement uh, for the capability of those of, of, of that particular part of the industrial system. So yeah, my answer, I guess, is I, I, I think that the, that the, the moment or the, the period uh, mm -hmm. in which the US, in which the industries themselves were of national scale. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, again, then that was true of, of, of aviation in the 50s and 60s, it was true of space, it was true of telecommunications. Um, no, I, I, th I, think, I think it's a serious, a serious problem. Uh, you, you mentioned semiconductors, maybe not semiconductors. We are in Europe also talk about uh, uh, the windmills, the sol solar e energy, uh, which move, which move to China, bring it back. Uh, uh, not only we have to uh, to, to support um, the economy uh, and the people to make this transformation, mm -hmm. but the support is going to China, so the answer is let's, let's make it in Europe. Is this a possibility? Well, you can certainly make them, you know, you can make things like this in, 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 in Europe, you can make them in the United States. Uh, the question is whether you can do so on a uh, long, sustainable, profitable basis. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, they, uh, I guess the answer to that question is you can, if you block out the uh, the the, uh, the the sales of uh, of from from a country that can produce them on much higher volume and at much lower cost, right? Okay, that's your choice. Well, we've we've seen examples of how that worked out. For example, for the Soviet Union mm -hmm. uh, and the. But also the the, Euro, Aust the European industry, uh, they uh, they are very anxious because, for example, the American uh, the American Inflation Reduction Act mm -hmm. because it supports industries uh, that also is an European industry and the European industry is moving to to, to the U.S. Is, May, obviously, course, it's, sure. it works in that way. Well, uh, uh, sure. I mean, I, I'm not saying that a company can't make some profit yeah. by doing this, uh, but. That why are they moving to the U.S.? Because uh, among other things, there's a subsidy and, and, and there's also a protective wall. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, does it, is, is this the right strategy mm -hmm. for dealing with, um, you know, with a, let's say the long-term so-called competitiveness of the economy? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, again, you may have compelling so-called national security reasons to do X, mm -hmm. or why. I don't know why you would have a compelling national security reason to buy your solar panels uh, from a high-cost producer. Right? I just, uh, I, don't, I don't quite see it uh, as a, uh, you know, as, as, unless that producer is going to be coming down the cost curve so that they're in a position to compete with, a, with, a, with producers who have, you know, markets many times larger. And that's going to be a very, that's a that's a rough, rough call. Uh, again, in the 1970s, when these ideas were current, there was no such competition. At that time, uh, you know, we were concerned about competition from Japan, uh, from Germany, uh, above all. Uh, China, China had essentially very little, no, practically no industrial trade with the United States, practically no trade of any kind. Right, but the so the, the world situation is, has very, very fundamentally changed. Um, so the, there, there's some anxieties why one can have the idea one should bring back some industries back home. One is the problem with the supply chains as we realized it in the last years for different reasons. First pandemic, second, uh, second war, uh, second reason the war. Um, uh, are these good reasons or no good reasons? 
Sorry? Are these good reasons or no good reasons? The, the supply chain issues? Yeah. Well, the supply chain problem in the pandemic, um, the principal one was semiconductors. Mm -hmm. uh, and what was the story there? The, the story in, in, the, in the pandemic was that semiconductor producers on Taiwan in particular uh, drew the con inference that because people were locked down in their homes mm -hmm. that they would be buying more electronic equipment, household appliances. And they were wrong. Uh, they were, in fact, what happened was that upper tier income people who couldn't go out to, uh, to restaurants and theaters decided to buy cars. And they had not, um, the cars now contain hundreds of semiconductors. Uh, and so they weren't available. Uh, and the production lines could not be geared up because it takes six months. Mm -hmm to produce a semiconductor. It's a process that requires lamination and then lamination and lamination. So it took them a, quite amount of time to, uh, to readjust to what they, when they realized that they had guessed wrong about how demand would be, what products would be affected. In the meantime, uh, so people couldn't get new cars, so they started buying used cars. The used cars are a fixed supply. That's an asset, it's not a production item. It shouldn't even be in the consumer price index. I mean, at least it shouldn't be in your conceptualization of inflation. Uh, and so the price of used cars went up 50% in the US. And this was a part of the spike in, the, in overall prices. Uh, well, eventually that works itself out. Now, are, are, is, is, it, is this a reason why American producers should now uh, have a domestic source of semiconductors. I don't see how that protects you from the semiconductor producers, uh, you know, misguessing where where demand's going to be, and it simply means that their this particular component will be more costly for American companies, which don't need any more competitiveness problems than they already have. Right? I mean, the the the, the situation is now very. Very serious. Uh, they, uh, uh, there aren't many electric vehicles coming from China to the U.S., but the Chinese factories are producing. Some of them producing electric vehicles every 16 seconds, with very few, very little labor. And that's just not something that you observe happening, even at, at Tesla, which has a large factory in Austin. So um, I, I, I would like to say, you know, there's a better solution to mm -hmm. this problem. Uh, I do not frankly see what it is. That's the first point. And the second point is I'm fairly sure that we will find that the great initiatives uh, that w were just, just been put in place, uh, first of all, very hard to allocate them in a sensible way because the government does not have the expertise. Uh, very hard to concentrate them uh, on particular competent players because the government likes to spread things out over a large country to make sure that there's something in every congressional district. Um, and you know, Biden said this explicitly in his, in his State of the Union. Um, and uh, very hard to monitor performance mm -hmm. because they don't have the, all of this has been eroded away under Clinton, under Reagan, Clinton, Bush, the U.S. government, these, this expertise which was there, there anymore. So that to me strikes me as, 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 as a, it, 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 I, it, I hate to be a, a, a sourpuss, but it's a problem for which I don't have, a, I don't have a, a solution. I just want to point out that my colleagues who are now congratulating themselves mm -hmm. on having finally implemented an idea that was a plausible idea 50 years ago. But isn't, isn't or, that or, what you are saying, yeah. a real problem for progressive economic thinking? Because usually we would, I would assume progressive economic thinking or left-wing economic thinking uh, uh, is driven by the idea with good industrial policy also, we uh, broaden our, our, the economic base, uh, we, uh, there's more growth, more growth, uh, there's the establishment of more good jobs for the people we, uh, we are the representatives yeah, yeah. of. Uh, what you are saying leads to the conclusion it's not possible in that way anymore. I think that um, 
the first thing one has to do mm -hmm. is adjust one's thinking to the realities, mm -hmm. however harsh they are. Yeah. Uh, and this is, the, this is the point of bringing yeah. these three yeah. stories together mm -hmm. into a single. So the economists, again, of my generation, who grew up and got their degrees at MIT, and I'm not talking about the Chicago fundamentalists mm -hmm. or the people who came in, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, in, in the Reagan era, who by and large have, you know, they, they've, they've, they've retired from the scene. But my generation, the leading sp uh, spokesmen of the economics profession, a few spokeswomen, but not many, uh, they, were, they predate that. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have, as I say, a managerial view of the macroeconomy and inflation. Uh, they have a mechanical view of the growth process, which is what got them in, you know, made them completely miscalculate on, on sanctions. Uh, and they have uh, a, they really don't think in, ter in terms of the technical aspects of, ma of mastering an industrial process. Uh, so they really can't distinguish between, or at least do not effectively distinguish between something that uh, looks like the space program mm -hmm. uh, and something that looks like a subsidy program, mm -hmm. a tax program, a tax incentive. Uh, and they think that if you, if you pass something the government can do, which is hand out money, that you will get the result. Uh, now, give, for example, Mariana Mazzucato yeah. uh, has a book, uh, this title I, I mentioned in this paper, but she describes a particular um, effort that was carried out in the late 60s, mm -hmm. um, or mid 60s actually, to design an, the lunar landing module for the Apollo program. And it was carried out by a company, Grumman, under the supervision of engineers at, the, at NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. And you ask, okay, how does that resemble what we're doing with semiconductors or electric vehicles or, or, or solar panels? And the answer is it doesn't at all mm -hmm. uh, because there's just that, that capability uh, to work with a company to get you know, the, the weight and the technical capabilities all in together in a package. The partner in the public sector is no longer there. It's no longer there. And that's, that is a result of the 40 years since, mm -hmm. since the, you know, the, well, since the, really began with the Reagan administration, but greatly accelerated under, the, under, uh, under Clinton and Bush. Uh, to come with one question back to the sanction mm -hmm. uh, issue. Um, Economic questions, maybe that is also a problem, are very often connected with some more moral view <laughs> and uh, moralistic view. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and when it comes to, to the question of sanctions, especially also in Austria, mm -hmm. uh, people are saying we are financing the war. For example, by the war of, of, of Putin's war, for example, by uh, buying still gas from Russia. Do we f f financing the war if we f uh, buy gas from Russia? No, you're not. <laughs> you can relax on that point. Russia has no trouble financing its military effort. It has something called the ruble, which it produces <laughs> itself. It doesn't need the euro. It doesn't need the dollar. Right? There's nothing that it buys from it. it what, what, they, what happened with the sanctions is breaking off an exchange in which the Europeans were buying things that you really do need, oil and gas, and the Russians were buying things that they don't need, cheese and poultry and wine and, uh, you know, good things, the nice things to have. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, they could easily grow their own chickens and they could easily, well, not so easily. I, I, I'm told that Russian cheese is not quite yet at the French standard, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, this is, if they have to do with a slightly inferior brand of cheese, they'll, 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 they'll survive that and, 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 and their quality will improve. Uh, but you, basically, there is no such thing as a slightly inferior brand of natural gas that you can have readily accessible. It's only their gas or something more expensive. Uh, so this is the way the exchange, the breakdown in the exchange happened. And it's entirely to the benefit of the Russians and entirely to the detriment of the Europeans. Do they need money? No, they don't need money. I mean, they had, they had $300 billion 
of reserves, actually six, I think the number 600 billion, half of which was frozen, is my understanding. What are reserves? It's just an account at somebody's central bank. It's a, it's a computer ledger entry. They had no ever any use for those reserves because they run a surplus. So they're always adding to them. They're not, they're not, it's not something they're gonna turn around and go on a spending spree uh, to buy stuff. So, you know, okay, the reserves will be, the, those reserves, if they're not actually confiscated, uh, the, what we're talking about now is taking the interest and funneling that off. And the Russians will retaliate. So what will the exchange be? It will be of real assets owned by Western companies in Russia, resource companies, partners of Gazprom and automobile companies and banks and so forth, and some of this is already happening which will be transferred to Russian enterprises, in return for which, uh, uh, you know, the, well, of course, the ultimate beneficiaries, of the Ukrainian government, I suppose, gets something. So the transfer is from Western firms to the Ukrainian government. Russia acting as an intermediary. Will Russia be worse off? No, no it won't be worse off from that. So the, before, the before financial I... leverage just isn't there. Before I give uh, the audience the op opportunity to come with some questions, I have some last questions about uh, the current situation because yeah. uh, uh, yesterday there was uh, the European elections. I there's, noticed there's that they a, had a, you had There is a kind of shift. Uh, I, 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 you feel better. We're going to have ours in November, so okay. we'll, we'll feel just as badly then as you do now. Uh, there is uh, some stronger and some not so strong shift to the mm -hmm. right in Austria, and it, it's It was quite strong in Germany too, in some other countries, <laughs> more or less. Uh, um, but how would you comment on that, given uh, the economic situation of Europe? And for example, the, we, we talked a lot in the last 10 years about mm -hmm. austerity politics in, at, the, uh, at the end of the financial crisis or after the financial crisis. Then uh, this this austerity politics en uh, ended, let's say, in 19, uh, 2016, 17. Uh, so the last years in Europe were a little bit better than 10 years ago. What, uh, what do you expect now after European uh, political uh, framework is shifting more to the right? How dangerous is that? I mean, in terms of economic policy, I don't know what, if anything, to expect mm -hmm. unless there is an articulation of an entirely different uh, perspective and mm -hmm. viewpoint uh, in this, uh, and which I'm not seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, what I, 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 I see is, uh, and I, I'm by no means an expert on the European mm -hmm. political situation, but uh, Two things. One, one is a, a, a rise of, of national sentiment, particularly among, you know, one of the shifts that appears to be amongst young voters. Uh, so the sort of a decline of the European identity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the other is uh, skepticism about the policy of the, with respect to Ukraine and Russia, mm -hmm. uh, which seems to be motivated. I mean, it, it, I don't know to what extent people who were simply skeptical about that, found that the only outlet was to vote for the right-wing parties. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, that's a skepticism which I have to say I don't find unreasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, but will this mean a change in the policy? Uh, that I find, unless someone tells me that there is an emerging position in European politics which, or let's say German politics that repudiates the debt break uh, and that goes into you know, investing, and Germany may be in a different situation with the United States with a stronger basic industrial, still mm -hmm. surviving industrial mm -hmm. structure. That, but a very, uh, uh, by all accounts, decaying infrastructure that has not been maintained for mm -hmm. decades and properly. Uh, and so uh, the, 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 you know, this, is, this is a situation which is perilous, but perhaps not beyond <clears throat> some recovery uh, if it were re re really focused on. But where in German politics are we hearing that? I'm not seeing it. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, uh, I, I, I can't say I feel any great sympathy or great regret <clears throat> at the 
at the at the drubbing that that President Macron got yesterday. Mm -hmm. it's, again, it's, these are you know, a political political classes which are clearly, um, uh, let's say, have lost the confidence of their voters. Mm -hmm. But I'm also I'm I'm the reason I am asking for sure the European economic policy, the German, uh, the. Uh, the policy by, by all, it's not very good, but we can imagine it, it can also get worse. It can always get worse, yes, that you should feel, that makes you feel better that it can get worse. <laughs> that, 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 yeah, you should be assured on that point. I know, you know, there's a big, the big difference is between Europe and the United States in this, and that is that for the moment we have uh, our own um, fairly abundant energy supply, mm -hmm. uh, which is largely due to the extreme productivity of the Permian Basin in mm -hmm. West Texas. Uh, and that, how long it will last, I can't tell you, I don't know. I do have, I'm at the University of Texas, I have friends who are physicists and geologists, and they don't know either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I mean, these are mysteries which are not yet, mm -hmm. you know, not yet resolved, but for the moment, mm -hmm. Of course, it's, it gives the United States a much more stable resource base mm -hmm. than is available mm -hmm. to Europe. And secondly, uh, the U.S. government has not committed, it's not recommitted itself to budgetary austerity. This is a threat, mm -hmm. something which could happen after the election, mm -hmm. uh, because there's always people who are pressing for this and want to cut Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. And, generally speaking, squeeze the American, what's left of the middle class. Mm -hmm. uh, but hadn't happened yet. And one of the things I think has changed in the, in the, in, in the mm -hmm. not so much under Biden, but really under Trump and then Biden, mm -hmm. uh, has been this kind of, uh, a fear of, of, uh, of, of a large government but spending budget deficits and so on. Uh, and, you know, they, they, they realized the experiment was made uh, and the world did not end in any mm -hmm. serious way. Um, mm -hmm. And it is not even responsible for the interest rate increases, which again have the, mm -hmm. um, uh, they seem to be having an effect quite different from what they did 50 years ago. Thank you at that point, yeah. James, for the questions answer with me. And now you have the possibility.